So they stopped Hitler's train, huh? Man, I would not want to be the guy that had to do that. But uh, what, what did Hitler do then? He called the French and the Italians together. Okay, okay. Huh, okay, thanks. <laughs> November 13th, 1942. The Allies realized months ago that they could not open a second European front this year, but they could open a new front in Africa, attacking the Vichy French African possessions, a big strike against the Axis powers. And that strike begins this week, Operation Torch. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Allies broke through in Egypt and decisively defeated Erwin Rommel's forces in the Second Battle of El Alamein. The Axis were also in trouble in the Caucasus, with the Panzer Division surrounded. There was a bit of a lull at Stalingrad the second half of the week, though, as both sides prepared new offensives. Adolf Hitler leaves the Eastern Front by train for Munich the afternoon of the 7th. The morning of the 8th, the train is halted, so he can be given a message from the Foreign Office in Berlin. It says that British radio is announcing that an American invasion force is making landings at Algiers, Oran, and Casablanca. This is Operation Torch. In victory or defeat, Torch was sure to be spectacular. An amphibious assault from the sea is one of war's most complex operations, and the Americans were making not one, but three landings. No one knew whether the troops would be greeted with bouquets or bullets. In fact, it was entirely possible that Torch would tip the balance against the Allies rather than for them. This is true. Remember, after the fall of France and the armistice, German troops had not occupied the French African possessions and only half of France itself. And so all high French officers agreed to honor the armistice and made personal oaths of loyalty to Philippe Pétain. Military honor is a big deal to an officer and that oath pretty clearly requires them to defend against allied attacks. At the same time, Nazi Germany is equally clearly their true mortal enemy. Torch begins on November 8th. There are three main sectors of operations. A Western task force lands at three points on a 350 kilometer front around Casablanca. George Patton commands the ground troops, 35,000 men strong. Henry Hewitt commands the naval support, two battleships, one fleet carrier, four escort carriers, and loads of cruisers and destroyers. There is a central task force landing near Oran, which is 39,000 men under Lloyd Friedendahl. The naval force there, is two escort carriers and smaller ships under Thomas Trowbridge. The Eastern Task Force lands at Algiers, 33,000 troops under Charles Ryder, 52 warships under Harold Burrow. The British 78th Division is landed here as well. Force H from the Royal Navy, three battleships, three fleet carriers, and many cruisers and destroyers guards the operation against the Italian fleet. A French resistance coup in Algiers neutralizes the 19th French Army Corps and local Vichy command. The rebels take the radio station, the telephone switchboard, and even the police station. So basically, Algiers falls to them with zero bloodshed and is ready to be turned over to the Americans, who are not there. They make landings 20 kilometers or so from the city, and they don't tell the resistance to maintain secrecy. Oran, well, it has a pretty ominous beginning. At 3 a.m., two former U.S. Coast Guard cutters that are now under British command under Lend-Lease smash into the harbor. However, Walney is blown up by French destroyers and Heartland is wrecked as well, though she reaches the jetty and men can leap to safety before she capsizes. East and west of the city itself, though, the landings go off perfectly, and by the end of the day, they have taken the local airfield. The heaviest opposition to the landings is near Casablanca at Porleote, where the landings are confused and the resistance is strong, though the invaders do soon gain the upper hand. French supporters help the invaders at all of the landings. This is most obvious at Algiers with the rebels. Alphonse Juin commands the French forces in Africa and is based there. And while he does not in any way wish to see an American occupation of Algeria, he can appreciate the reality of the coming situation, and he calls Francois Darlan. Allied High Command is surprised when they hear that Darlan, commander of all Vichy French forces, is actually in the city on personal business. His son is ill. 
he is one of the main Vichy leaders, so his presence could command wide support, especially from the Navy, his career branch of service. Darlan stalls, though, and police and military units begin rounding up the rebels. Soon the radio broadcasts Pétain saying, We are attacked. We shall defend ourselves. This is the order I am giving, again and again. However, the rebels manage to reach Ryder, and his planned methodical encirclement of the city is shelved in favor of a direct and overwhelming advance. By the end of the afternoon, Algiers is in Allied hands, as is Darlan. In Casablanca, Admiral Michelier is very much anti-British. The thing is, most naval support and merchant shipping for the operation is provided by the British. But the Allies have worked hard to convince the French that this is a mainly American operation, hence most of the attack troops being American, as well as the diplomats and military contacts with the French. This is to avoid anti-British distrust. Spain and Portugal, on the other hand, have more cordial relations with the British. And it is the British that are responsible for the Spanish not aiding any German attack through Spain to Gibraltar. You get all this from the broadcasts of the day. President Roosevelt and Eisenhower broadcast out to the French and British promises to respect Spanish neutrality to the Spaniards. My point concerning Michelier, though, is that he obeys Pétain's order to fight. And he has nine destroyers, a light cruiser, and an unfinished battleship at Casablanca Harbor. They attack the Allied naval force, though they cannot hope to defeat Hewitt's armada. By noon, eight of those 11 French ships are beached, sunk, on fire, or just out of action. On the 9th, the Americans secure the beachhead at Casablanca and Porliote. Oran still holds out, but armored columns now head east there from Algiers. Vichy French Prime Minister Pierre Laval says he'll allow the Germans to use Tunisian airfields, and German troops begin arriving to use Tunisia as a base from which to fight back. Henri Giraud, who we saw last week, the Allies have tapped to lead the French, arrives in Algiers this day, and the Allies discover that he doesn't actually have much authority at all. Darlan does, though, so General Mark Clark pushes him to declare in the Allies' favor. Darlan is still waiting to see which way the wind blows. On the 10th, Oran surrenders and Patton's troops begin entering Casablanca. Darlan now broadcasts the order for all French forces in North Africa to stop fighting the Allies. He also sends an appeal to the French fleet at Toulon to set sail and join them in Africa. Hitler, Laval, and Italian Foreign Minister Count Chano meet in Munich. They will try to hold on to as much territory as possible so Germany violates the 1940 armistice and invades Vichy France in response to Darlan's ceasefire. All France will now be under direct German rule. All U-boats in the Atlantic, with enough fuel for the voyage, are ordered to North Africa. There are 25 of them. On the 11th, the French officially sign an armistice. Allied troops have taken 2,000 kilometers of the African coast in 72 hours. On the 13th, a controversial agreement is signed between Clark and Darlan, making Darlan head of the French civil government in North Africa. Giraud is to command the armed forces. While all this is happening, the Allied breakout from Egypt is continuing. On the 10th, they begin an offensive from Solom. They reach Bardia the 11th, Tobruk the 12th, and take it at the end of the week. They are now back in Libya. And also on the 10th, Bernard Montgomery is promoted from Lieutenant General to Full General and knighted. But what does this mean? What does all this mean for the future situation in North Africa? The Allies now have the northwestern coast, but Rommel is still on the loose, and he has a pretty big reputation. But if, I say if, the Allies can take Tunisia and take it quickly, then his supply lines will be destroyed and he will be trapped and there are 15,000 French troops in Tunisia, way more than needed to handle the arriving Germans. Admiral Darlan, however, shrank from ordering the Tunisian garrison to shoot at Germans, even after ordering shooting at the Allies in Algeria and Morocco to stop. Nor could the French commanders of the garrison bring themselves to put aside notions of military honor and loyalty to Marshal Pétain to act on their own. So the French garrison just watches the Junkers' transports arrive one after another. The Germans will try to hold the northern coastal ports 
while sending enough men south to, to keep the door open for Rommel. If the Axis can hold Tunisia, they'll still be able to force most Allied shipping to the Indian Ocean to go the long way around Africa. That's gonna help tie down a lot of traffic that could be used to replace ships lost in the planned Atlantic U-boat offensive early in 1943. The Allied landings in North Africa also benefit the Soviet Union. 400 of the 500 German planes now flown to Tunisia come from the fighting in the USSR, as well as a few hundred transport planes to bring in all the men. These have been supplying the Wehrmacht in the Stalingrad campaign. This causes bombers to now be brought in as transports for Stalingrad and no longer used as bombers. They also send torpedo bombers from Norway to North Africa, and these are what had been savaging the Allied Arctic shipping convoys. Speaking of the Soviets, they too are about to launch an offensive of their own. Operation Uranus, the counteroffensive to try to encircle and destroy the Axis forces attacking Stalingrad, is set to go off the 9th. On the 8th, the spearhead attack troops man their positions, and the orders are signed. But on the 9th, the whole thing is postponed. Yep. This is mainly because of unit movement delays. Prokofi Romanenko's 5th Tank Army, for example, is not yet in position, and they are to play a major part, but they are far from alone. On the 11th, Soviet commander Georgi Zhukov tells Joseph Stalin and Stavka the situation. He goes over the orders and the deployments, already approved by Stavka, and then the hopeful result. The junction of the tank and mechanized forces of the southwestern and Stalingrad fronts is to take place on the eastern bank of the River Don in the area of Kalach Sovietsky, timed for the evening of the third or fourth day of operations. There is now every reason for the offensive to be opened on the 19th. All of the military Soviets of fronts and armies on the Stalingrad axis and all commanders about to take part in this first extensive operation by our operational scales and we ourselves believe in its success. So, it's now time to go off the 19th. Or is it? Because at 6.30 a.m. on the 11th, German 6th Army Commander Friedrich Paulus launches the main attacks of Operation Hubertus in Stalingrad, a final try before winter to crush the Soviet 62nd Army and break through to the Volga in force. It begins with artillery and airstrikes, and then a few hours later, just before noon, the German attack wave of men and machines reaches the Volga on a 500 meter front and 62nd Army is now split for the third time. Thing is, Hubertus really begins already the 9th and as I said last week, it's a pioneer and sapper operation. That day, the Germans take the oil refinery, but not much more. This is a prelude to Paulus's eventual goal of the Lazur chemical works and taking the entire tennis racket itself. On the 11th, the chimneys of Barakati are leveled by the Luftwaffe, ending the Soviet recon and sniping efforts from that quarter. The fighting, the last three days of the week, really is the stereotypical Stalingrad fighting, building by building, room by room, man by man. By the 13th, Krasny Oktyabr fully falls to the Germans. Ivan Yudnikov's 138th rifles are cut off south of Barakati. The left and right flanks of 62nd grimly hold on, but rammed right to the river edge was now a formidable German salient, which left Yudnikov trapped in a space 400 by 700 meters. Behind them was the river, but this highway of help was closing before their eyes. The Volga was freezing, the slush packing into dangerous floating ice. Rowing boats had to take over from ferries, but they stood no chance once they came under German machine gun fire or were shelled by light guns. On the 9th, the temperature drops to minus 18 degrees. Yudnikov's men have no more grenades and no more ammo for automatic weapons, but his biggest problem is that he is soon down to 500 men. Another thousand or so men under Colonel Gorokhov still hold out in the north at Rinok and Spartanovka, and five battered divisions in the south. One of them, the 13th Guards, who with 1,500 men left, are currently the strongest division of 62nd Army. But hold out they must if the counterattack next week is to succeed. It's the Axis forces, however, who are trying to hold out this week in the Caucasus. The encircled 13th Panzer Division 
loses most of its supply troops straight off the bat. And for the first five days of the week, the Soviets just, just maul them. The 23rd Panzers are not strong enough to break through to relieve them. Ewald von Kleist rushes over units from the SS Viking Division, who arrive the 10th, and the 13th breaks out and links up with them late on the 11th. Though leaving behind most of their stuff, they've lost 80 tanks and 1,088 trucks in a week. Kleist calls off the whole offensive. Some other fighting reaching its end this week is happening the other side of the world. On the 9th and 10th, Australian 25th Brigade takes Gorari. The Japanese are now cut off at Oivi, General Tomitaro Hori with them. There is fighting the rest of the week in the region. The Japanese finally pull back across the Kamusi River, leaving 600 dead, and Hori actually drowns during this retreat. This is the end of Japanese resistance there outside the beachheads at Gona and Buna. There is a lot more fighting in the South Seas this week, though. Okay, the Japanese are to send 11 transports carrying 11,000 men to Guadalcanal the 13th. Cover and bombardment of Henderson Field is to be provided by major warships of the combined fleet. Japanese carriers are also at sea further north to send in planes. Thing is, Hypo Intelligence Station cracks Japanese communications and learns that this is going to happen and the Americans rush in 6,000 reinforcements to land two days earlier, the 11th. They are escorted by Norman Scott's cruiser and four destroyers. But the men are prevented from landing by air attacks from both Rabaul and those Japanese carriers. Scott, joined by Uncle Dan Callahan's cruisers, manages to offload most of the men and supplies the 12th, despite another big bombing raid, which they fight off with the help of Wildcats from Henderson Field. Then that night, Callahan and Scott bring their now five cruisers and eight destroyers into the slot to intercept the fleet of enemy warships Recon has spotted coming. They know they're going to be outnumbered, but they do not know they've got two battleships, a light cruiser, and 14 destroyers to deal with. They all meet rather confusedly just after 1.30 a.m. Scott orders open fire just as his flagship Atlanta is lit up by battleship Hei. A quick flurry of attacks wipes out Atlanta's bridge, killing Scott and rendering the ship uncontrollable. The American ships are now heading between enemy battleships and their escorts and taking fire from both sides. Callahan orders, odd ships fire to starboard, even ships to port, which is weird since they have not been numbered beforehand. Two American destroyers are blown apart, but the fires started on Japanese ships by American destroyer fire caused Japanese commander Hiroaki Abe to withdraw. He doesn't know the size of the force he's facing. His chief of staff has been killed and he himself is wounded. Callahan now orders his cruisers to hit the big targets first. This is his final order. Battleship Kirishima and several other ships concentrate fire on his flagship San Francisco and destroy the bridge, killing him and all hands there. An American heavy cruiser and light cruiser are knocked out of action. Two more American destroyers are sunk. It's been a total of under 40 minutes. And when the gunfire fully dies away and the Japanese withdraw, Abe has lost two destroyers. But his flagship, Hei, is on fire and its steering is going. Atlanta soon sinks after being run aground. The damaged light cruiser Juno is blown apart this morning by a Japanese submarine with almost all hands drowning or feeding the sharks. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Sullivan lose five sons when it goes down. The US Navy will soon issue regulations that ban relatives from serving on the same ship. Two US admirals have lost their lives this night. However, the Japanese battleships have been driven off before they can carry out their bombardment and support the Japanese landings. And Henderson Field is still operational. Furthermore, today the limping Hiai is caught by the Cactus Air Force and damaged to the point where Abe orders it scuttled. He will be removed from command by Isoroku Yamamoto. The Japanese landings are postponed until tomorrow. But this evening, Gunichi Mikawa's heavy cruiser force runs the slot and fires a thousand rounds at Henderson Field. These are 8 inch shells and not 14 inch like the battleships and they wreck 18 planes and damage the field, but they do not put it out of action. This battle is not over. It continues into next week. As does this series, but for today, it is finished. But what a week it has been. 
with the Allies invading Northwest Africa, the Germans invading France. Again, Rommel on the run, action winding down in the Caucasus and the Kokoda Trail, and yet another German offensive in Stalingrad, and Allied shipping convoys finally reach Malta from Alexandria. The siege there is effectively ended after two years and five months. There's a lot of speechifying going on this week too. On the 7th, the 25th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, the second of the 1917 revolutions after which the Bolsheviks took temporary power until the Constituent Assembly could meet and form a government, but they shut that down in January 1918, kept power, and then eventually won a civil war to keep it. Well, Joseph Stalin holds a speech in which he, reasonably accurately, outlines the war in the USSR the past 17 months, the tenacity of the defenders, and the fact that the Axis forces in 1942 are not as strong as those in 1941. Adolf Hitler gives a speech the 8th on the 19th anniversary of his failed Beer Hall push, in which he announces to Germany his plans to launch attacks to take the final parts of Stalingrad, but that's basically all over. And British Prime Minister Winston Churchill has this to say to the House of Commons on the 10th during Torch, but about the Allied victory over Rommel. Now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. There is also a definite crisis in Africa, perhaps a major turning point even. We did an awesome miniseries on a later crisis that involves Africa and the Middle East, the Suez Crisis, in five parts and two preludes. You can check that out on our Time Ghost History Channel right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Daniel Powers. Thanks to the Army, we can make this content and that content and all of our content. So join the Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.